Shabbat Shalom, everybody. We want to welcome you out once again. The manna from heaven. Those are Korahs too. May the earth swallow those things up so that we have a, a continued solid path to cross into the promised land. Would you guys agree with that? Let's give Abba a big shout and a big hand clap to Minister Brittany Scott for bringing the word. <laughs> Amen. Shabbat Shalom. You excited to be here? I believe you are. Amen. I know I am. It's amazing to me as the worship team was singing, you know, sometimes you need to be reminded. Sometimes, as Brother John was talking about, those situations try to overtake you, and you forget who it is that you serve. You forget that he is the living one, the one that steps on the scene and is able to deliver you no matter what the circumstance may be. And it's just inspiring and amazing to me that the name above all names, the name that is worshipped 24-7 in the heavenlies, he chose you as the resting place for that name. Amen? And as the resting place of that name, with that name's with that name comes everything that that name entails, the authority, the, the power, the redemption, the deliverance, the ability to be sustained in whatever situation you may be in. And so as a believer, as one that's walking and carrying that name, as the days continue to get darker, as the days begin to continue to be more chaotic and confusion reigns as a carrier of the name, you should be able to step onto the scene and say, be still. Amen? And as Shepherd John was alluding to, this week's Torah portion is quite an interesting one. Korah is always interesting. We've been called Korah. We've encountered Korahs. <laughs> We've dealt with Korahs, situations and people. Korah is always an interesting Torah portion that reveals some very unique aspects. It's also quite interesting and kind of comical to me because Korah happens to be my birth Torah portion. <laughs> Some people may take that opposite, but <laughs> I'm choosing it in the sense of having unique insight into some of these things in order to expose and deal with it. Amen. <laughs> this week's Torah portion, Korah, it's taken from Numbers chapter 16, verse 1 through chapter 18, verse 32. And if you've read it, if you're familiar with it, you know that it covers the rebellion within the camp of Israel. And it's regarding who has the right to lead Israel. It's a fight over the priesthood. And interestingly enough, it ends with thousands dead, directly upon the heels of the sin of the spies. If you follow along in the Torah portions, you know that directly before this chapter, the spies are sent into the land of their inheritance, and they bring back a negative report. The very reason they are brought and delivered out of Egypt to go in and take possession and set up the kingdom of Yahweh in the land of their inheritance, they bring back a negative report. And we find that the next several Torah portions, it's kind of just a nosedive, straight down, because you're dealing with a group of people that lacked the faith and the belief in the one true Elohim to do what he said he was going to do. Amen. Now, as we look at this Torah portion, we have to remember, and also over these next several ones, they're prophetic. These portions are a blueprint that reveal events beyond themselves. It is not just a historical event that this man, thousands of years ago, chose to rebel against Moshe. And this is a little lesson for the, to teach the children that they don't need to be rebellious. This goes much beyond that scope. When you take this Torah portion, Korah, and I believe the next few that are coming up, all of these can be overlaid directly on events that are happening now. And you'll find that it will give you some insight into what's happening and what's going to continue to unfold. Because it's quite interesting that there is still an ongoing war over the office of the priesthood. And it's going to become more and more evident as the days go on. And those that are more plugged into the Hebrew roots, you know that there's been arguments between the role of the Melchizedek priesthood, the eternal priesthood of the Messiah, the Melech Sadiq, the righteous king, and that of those who will attempt to use the guise of the Aaronic or Levitical priesthood, but will truly be a Korah rebellion instead. And we find that there's, there's a lot of commotion and noise taking place regarding this coming third temple, this coming reinstitution of a priesthood. And yet, 
As believers, what does this mean for us? How do we deal with this? And we find that as you begin to look at some of these aspects, and as we've already done several teachings on this, you know that this coming institution doesn't accept the role of Messiah as the high priest. And so then they rise up as something that's rebelling against the very authority of Messiah in this role. So we have to ask, what's the significance of this? Why is this so important that this is the venue, this is the doorway they attempt to gain control and step through? Why is this going to play such a pivotal role in the end days? And where do we fall in this? And what does the Korah rebellion reveal? And as we continue to look at this, you'll find that if we don't understand what the significance of this calling is, of what it means to be a king and priest in Messiah, how we're expected ourselves to walk in this position, then how can we say without a doubt that we won't play a part in this coming rebellion? Because how many of you realize that when you begin to discuss some of these things, there's going to be a line that's going to be drawn in the sand, and you will either be for Messiah, a part of his kingdom, doing his work, walking in his footsteps, or you will be against him. There will be no middle ground. There will be no, well, I'm kind of walking with you, but I'm also going to walk a little bit over here. And so then we have to ask, how can we know without a doubt that we have firmly planted ourselves on the correct side? Amen? Unless we understand the responsibility that goes with being called as kings and priests. And it's something, it's a phrase that even as believers that are outside of the full understanding, it's kind of a phrase that's been coined, oh, we're a king and priest, we're a king and priest. And yet when you begin to really delve into this, my goodness, it's a powerful thread that we see from Genesis to Revelation. It's so significant that we find Adam is created and given this role. The whole redemption story of creation follows this concept of the one that would be a king and priest representing Messiah on the earth. And we find that you'll follow this thread all the way until the full restoration of mankind back to our creator, where we're told in Revelation chapter 5 that we will rule with him on the earth, on the place that he created as our inheritance as kings and priests, as was intended at the very beginning. And so we find this is a thread that's so significant from Genesis all the way to Revelation. We start in the role with the mantle of king and priest, and we end finally with the restored mantle of kings and priests alongside him. So let's take a look at this Torah portion. In Numbers chapter 16, verse 1, we begin to read about this individual named Korah who attempts to rebel against the chosen priests of the time over Israel and chooses to attempt to create his own, so to speak. And in chapter 16, verse 1, we read, Now Korah, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, and Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliav and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men. And they rose up before Moshe with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, famous in the congregation, men of renown. And they gathered themselves against, together against Moshe and against Aaron and said unto them, You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregation are holy, every one of them, and Yahweh is among them. Wherefore then lift you up yourselves above the congregation of Yahweh. And it's quite interesting because the Torah takes the time to give you the lineage of Korah. Korah is a Levite. Korah is within the lineage of Aaron's household. He's a cousin. And so we find that it's not some distant outsider that's coming in and bringing this delusion and trying to usurp the role. It's someone that's quite close within the family lineage that looks like he has a really good claim to assert this position. In other words, I believe it's a warning. We better have discernment because if the enemy is going to bring a counterfeit, he's not going to take something that's off the wall that you'll spot a mile away. He's going to bring something that looks really similar, so close to the genuine, as close as he can get it. And if it was possible, even the elect would be deceived. Let's look at this name, Korah. It's Strong's number 7141, Korah, and it's translated as meaning bald. It comes from the root meaning to make oneself bald, specifically for the dead, an act that we find Israel and specifically the priests are admonished against in Leviticus 21 and Deuteronomy 14. And you'll find that when you begin to study the way that this particular term is used, it's dealing specifically with a pagan ritual. And so before all the Torah police 
And all of the chorus choose to come out and try to say things about certain hairstyles or anything along those lines. That's, you've completely missed the point. It's dealing with a specific act that was dealing with a pagan ritual worshiping the pagan dead fallen ones and the ones that have passed. This is what Israel is admonished. Do not partake in this. And he lists some other pagan traditions that were associated all with this act of worshiping and honoring the fallen ones or the dead ones. And when we begin to look at this, we find then that not only is this an act, a pagan ritual that's associated with the mourning of the dead, of one who has passed, but it's also connected with the worship of that pagan or dead entity or God behind this ritual. But as I was looking at this, it was quite interesting to me because I saw some connections that I've never seen before. And when you begin to look just a little bit into some of these ancient pagan customs and, and why they did what they did, you'll find that this tradition is also connected to customs of inheritance as well. We find that the one who is prepared to receive the inheritance regarding the one that has just passed, this is part of the ritual. They shave their head. Literally, they give their hair in order to receive their inheritance. And so now when we look at this, my goodness, wait a minute. Korah's name, remember, names are prophetical. In fact, the rabbis will say that Korah actually took this name for himself. He proclaims this as his title. Why? Because it's revealing the nature and the mindset of who this individual is. Now, this is quite interesting because, remember, we've already mentioned that this is directly on the heels of this generation of Israel being told that they will not enter the land of their inheritance. And directly on the heels of being told, you're cut off. This inheritance will not pass to you, but it will pass to your children, to the next generation. Directly on the heels of this rises up an individual who has taken the name as Korah. And his name reveals that he has already been involved in some pagan rituals, contacting the dead ones in order to give something of himself to receive an inheritance that he's just been denied. Now, there's another interesting point, and that's at the Hebrew word for hair. Remember, in these rituals, they give their hair in order to receive something from the one they've called upon. The Hebrew word for hair, it's Strong's number 8181, Se'ar, and it's translated as meaning hair, and yet the exact same letters, just the vowel points change, gives you Strong's number 8179, Se'ar, and it's translated as meaning gate, or gateways. Hair in the Hebrew mindset too, you'll find it's endowed with a symbolic value that has to do with an intense experience and thus with receiving knowledge. That's why you'll find several passages throughout the scriptures where he talks about the hair and it's all, it seems like there's a deeper meaning to it. And this is why, because it, rep, it was symbolic of something more than itself. And so it would seem then that when we begin to look at this name Kor, this individual who's rising up, attempting to usurp the priesthood and the leadership of Israel, it would seem then that these ancient cultures understood that there's a deeper meaning behind these rituals. It's not just for mourning, but it's about gateways being opened for the purpose of having an experience and receiving knowledge and blessings from whatever fallen or dead one that they're calling upon. And so now you're beginning to get some insight into who Korah is, what Korah is doing. But also remember, this can be overlaid directly right now on what's taking place. Because in the days ahead, you're going to see Korah rise up again. And it's already, this Torah portion begins to give you insight into the individual that you're dealing with. One that's stepping onto the scene, who's already been denied access, but he's open gateways in order to receive knowledge and experience from the dead ones in order to attempt to usurp something that he has no right to access. And it was quite interesting to me as we were talking about this, because right now, cloaked as technological and scientific advancement, there's some things that are mirroring exactly what Korah was involved in. When we were talking about this yesterday, Pastor David reminded me that Alexa... Will now, vo will now mimic the voices of your dead loved ones. And most people will say, oh my goodness, it's a technological advancement. My goodness, I can hear the voice of the one that's passed away. And yet they'll cloak it in these flowery terms, and yet it's necromancy. It's speaking to the dead. 
And then now when we look at this, my goodness, this is what Korah is involved in. And that the moment you begin to speak to the dead ones, how many of you realize that it's about having an experience to receive knowledge, but it goes way deeper than that. It's an ancient ritual. It's the opening of a gateway. And it's gateways that are in your individual homes. And so now you can begin to understand the tentacles of this beast system and what he's going to use in order to set this up, unbeknowing to most people that aren't understanding and walking in the discernment. My goodness, they've just aligned themselves under Korah. They've just now also begun to allow these gateways to be open, to call upon one, to have an experience, to gain knowledge from something they have no business interacting with. And as we were continuing to look at that, it's no accident that starting tomorrow and over the next several days, CERN is celebrating 10 years of research. And they're going to be live streaming celebrations across multiple platforms, translating it into multiple languages, with the finale on July 5th, starting what they're referring to as Run 3, where they're going to once again power up the Collider. And they're going to set a new energy record in what they refer to as stable beam collisions. When you begin to go back and you look a little bit further at what they're doing over there in Switzerland, you know that they're messing with things once again they have no business messing with, and it's about opening gateways. And so when you look at this, my goodness, once these gateways are open, which is what they've been working on for years now, and they're fixing to once again power it up, open these spiritual gateways, these portals, so to speak, once they're open, though, what's the next step? What's about to happen? Can these answers be found in the pattern of Korah? Korah was also intent on opening the same gateways. And it's no accident that the end of Korah is that he's swallowed by the very portals and gateways that he was attempting to access to receive power and authority. He's swallowed by that himself and destroyed. Amen? And so it's quite interesting that whether we understand or not, these things are happening. And whether the world gets it or not, this is going to be something that's going to become very prevalent in the days ahead. The book of Revelation describes it using biblical terminology, but you're seeing it in the news. It's just using scientific terms. So it seems that the rebellion of Korah is revealing much more than meets the eye. This individual, by taking on this name Korah, seems to be revealing that he is one who has prostituted himself to the dead ones in order to usurp an inheritance that has been denied by Yahweh. And we find that the very next step is now he seeks the priesthood. And now remember, Kor is a pattern. This passage was not written for the generation that experienced it. They didn't need to be reminded. They saw it. They saw the ground open. They saw Kor be swallowed. They understood the dangers of messing with things that Yahweh told them don't go there. It's for this generation that's going to see Korah rise up on the scene again, and it becomes this pattern. He, op he attempts to open the gateways, and the very next step we find Korah participating in is now he seeks the priesthood. Why? What's so significant about inserting oneself into this position? He's opened gateways. He sought another source for inheritance and blessings. Why then seek to overtake the priesthood of Israel? Why not just go and do your own thing? Go worship the God you want to worship. Go get your inheritance over there. But have you noticed that the enemy will always, he's never content to just have his own power and authority over here. His whole plan all along is to always attempt to insert himself exactly where Yahweh himself has said, this is my throne, this is where my name is. So perhaps only then can we understand why the anti-Messiah as well will follow the same pattern. He'll attempt to usurp this role as well. And also perhaps we'll gain understanding then as why the role of the priest on the earth representing Messiah from Adam forward is continually attacked, so much so that today most believers don't understand what it means to function as this nation of kings and priests. We have... They have no idea, they have no understanding of what it truly means to walk this out. 
And we have to ask the question as we're looking at this pattern of Korah, opening the gates and then immediately needing to insert himself into the role of the high priest or the priesthood of Israel. Do you think perhaps that there's a connection that the ability to possess the gates is directly tied to this position of walking as a priest? In Genesis chapter 22, verse 17, Abraham was told, Thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. It's no accident that Abraham was functioning in this role as the Malik Zadik, the high priest, representing Yahweh on the earth, carrying his covenant, and it's passed down generation to generation. And yet in order, it seems, to possess the gates of the enemies, it's directly tied to understanding what it means to function as a king and priest, to wear this mantle. It's no accident that the moment Kor opens these gateways, immediately now he must take this on. If this is the case, then, the restoration of this office of the priests, of kings and priests, via the work of Messiah becomes paramount. He restores you and I to the calling of a royal priesthood in order for us to be able to successfully possess the gates to establish his kingdom and authority upon the earth, making his enemies his footstool. Amen? And if that's the case, then we need to look at this word for priest, the priesthood. In fact, Moshe makes this statement when he's confronting Korah, do you seek the priesthood also? Let's look at the word for priesthood. It's Strong's number 3550. It's kahuna. It's translated as priesthood from the root Kohen. When you break down this word Kohen, how many of you realize that every single Hebrew letter has a corresponding picture And so when you see this word Cohen, even though it's defined merely as priest, what is a priest? What does a priest do? It's the letters that form this word that begin to reveal what this anointing is, what this mantle is. Cohen is formed by inserting the letter He into the Kaf Noon root. The letter He means to reveal something released or breathed, creative power. The Kaf Noon root means to establish a standard. In other words, the one who functions in the role of the priest is the one whose words, once released, once breathed out, becomes and establishes the standard. So now you can begin to understand the significance of the role. This is why Adam was created as that king and priest on the earth. This is why Messiah came as the priest forever on the earth. It's a fight over who has the right and the authority to release seed, to word the people and therefore establish dominion, which is why it is directly connected to the gates. How many realize the gates are a symbol of the mouth? The gates are the mouth of the home. They're the mouth of the city or the mouth of the nation. In other words, to function in the role of a priest, you're to be a gatekeeper or a doorkeeper. You're charged with guarding the gates. And it's interesting because we understand you're to guard the gates of your mind. Why? Because you've been called as a king and priest. You're to guard these gates first. How many realize that if I can't guard these gates, then how can I guard the gates of my home? And if I can't guard the gates of my home, then how can I step into the role to guard the gates of my community? And if I can't guard the gates of my community, how can I step into the role where I'm going to change and guard the gates of the nation? Amen? And so now you can begin to understand why the significance is placed on understanding. Multiple times in the New Testament, we're told he's made you a royal priesthood. He came to make you a nation of kings and priests. Why? Because there's an authority and there's a responsibility that goes along with this that has to do with establishing his name and dominion on the earth. Amen? Now, it's no accident that the numerical value of Cohen, priest, is the same as Hallel, Lucifer. They both equal 75 in the Hebrew language. Lucifer and Cohen. It's a mantle he has long sought after for this very reason, because whether the average believer understands it or not, he does. That's why from the very beginning, he attempts to compromise Adam's role in regards to being a king and priest, because he understands the priest guards the gates. The priest releases the word. The priest is the one that chooses the seed that's going to be planted in order to produce a harvest and establish something in the earth. 
Now, as we look closer at this root word of Korah, Korah, an interesting distinction is found because you'll find that the root of the name Korah, that word dealing with to make oneself bald, specifically in this mourning pagan ritual, it's seen in both Leviticus 21 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Both read very similar in the English translations regarding the prohibition for making oneself bald for the dead. Leviticus 21 is in the rules specifically for the priests. Deuteronomy 14 is for the entire nation of Israel. They're admonished against this as well. Where things get interesting, though, is that in the Hebrew, two different terms are used for the word dead in these two verses. In Deuteronomy 14, the term for dead, when he's addressing the entire nation of Israel, don't do this in mourning for the dead, the word for dead is the common expected word moot. Strong's number 4191, to die, to be put to death, dealing with, it can deal with the spiritual death, but we also understand in multiple passage a physical death. And Deuteronomy 14 is where this is seen, but in Leviticus chapter 21, when he's dealing specifically with the Kohanim, the priesthood, and they're told not to do this in mourning for the dead, the word for dead in Hebrew is not moot, it's nephesh. Strong's number 5315. Nephesh means your soul, life, emotion, passion, desire, the mind, or the inner being. It's who you are. And so when we see this connection, well, wait a minute, what's taking place here? There's a distinction that's being made. There's a, there's a distinction between one who's just an average individual in Israel and the level of responsibility that comes with walking as a king and priest. Could this be indicating that there's a greater hazard? When one who is called and functioning as a priest or a nation of priests finds themselves compromised by contact with death, or when one in this compromised condition attempts to intrude into this office, it seems as if the Hebrews are revealing it's going beyond a physical contamination that's taking place. It's not just affecting your physical body. Instead, it's affecting the nephesh. It's affecting the mind, the soul, the desire, the passion, the inner man. And when we continue to look at this looking closer, it's no accident that nephesh has a numerical value in the Hebrew of 430. 430 is a number that's associated with bondage. We find the number of years of bondage in Egypt is associated with 430, as well as the number of years of exile prophesied by Ezekiel. 40 years for Judah and 390 for Israel, for a total of 430 of exile. Could this be revealing then that when one functioning in the office of the priest is compromised by death or the dead ones, anyone who is under their covering then is brought into exile and bondage. And it not only speaks of a physical exile, but a literal enslavement of the mind, the inner man, and now you can begin to understand why you're admonished to renew your mind. Why? Because you've been called as a king and priest and Messiah. It's your responsibility to make sure you're walking with a renewed mind and it's not been contaminated by contact from another source, the dead ones, that would attempt to enslave or bring this mind into bondage. And so as we continue to look at this, it seems then that it's only from this position of Cohen priest, that one has the ability to affect the nephesh, the mind, the inner man, and in that position he has the ability to either send one into exile and bondage or to restore and redeem. In fact, we're going to look at some examples that support this, and this also then supports and just reiterates the fact that when Messiah was here, he was walking as the high priest. Why? Because he came in order to restore the mind to the people. Amen? Hence the reason understanding the Messiah's role as the high priest is fundamental to our restoration and deliverance. If we don't understand him in this role, then how can we be restored and redeemed and have our minds renewed? Because it's only through the office of that priest, the Kohen, the great Haggadol, the high priest, that he's able to restore the minds to the people that have been exiled and in bondage, separated from the name, separated from the presence. Amen? 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, And all things are of Yah 
who hath reconciled us to himself by Yeshua Messiah and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He does this through the work of the Kohen Haggadol. And as we continue to look at this, Romans chapter 6, verse 9, we find it also reiterates that death has do no dominion over him. And this is quite interesting because here we're looking at the compromised position of Korah, who has allowed himself to be to literally offer up himself to the dead ones, who is contaminated by death. And yet Romans 6, 9, speaking of the one and true high priest, tells us that death has no dominion over him, revealing that he is the only high priest who is not subjugated by death. He's not compromised by the dead ones. Therefore, the only one who can hold this office and bring restoration and deliverance, not only physical, but spiritual to the very nephesh or mind of man. It's quite interesting because when you look at the example, all others prior to Messiah, even when they're walking in righteousness, they're tainted by death in the end due to Adam's sin. They can't fully bring this full restoration. They can only look forward in hope, knowing that there is one coming that will do this, that will bring this complete restoration, and that was Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen? And so as we continue to look at this, then, are you beginning to make some connections? Perhaps maybe the light bulb is turning on regarding the significance and purpose, then, perhaps, behind this coming third temple and reinstated priesthood, and the effect that it will have upon the people. If the Messiah's work as the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, has restored and delivered us, then what is the purpose of this coming reinstating of another priesthood that will stand in opposition and not accept him or acknowledge him in that role? And so we have to, we realize as we look at this that whether with full understanding or caught up in zeal, the results will be the same. When there is one standing in the office of the priesthood that is tainted by death, it reveals exile and bondage of the nephesh or the mind. And now you can begin to understand when we look around the world as a whole, the current mindset of the majority, it's very evident who they have allowed the priest to be in their own lives. You look at society now, and you, many of you will probably say and think, my goodness, they've lost their mind. That's an apt description. Not even just from a believer's standpoint, but just a common sense standpoint, it seems as if society at large has lost their mind. And yet when we begin to look at this, my goodness, this is the tentacles of Korah already reaching out because what does this one do? The one that has offered himself to the dead ones, when he steps into this role, it exiles the nephesh. It exiles the mind. It separates you from the mind of Yah. Now, it's no accident that the numerical value of Korah, his name, equals 308. It's the same value as the Hebrew term bush. Strong's number 954, and it means to be put to shame, to be ashamed, to be disconcerted. When applied to the mind, it can indicate troubled, disturbed, confused, as well as to be put to silence. And it's quite interesting because the first time we see this term in the Hebrew, in the Torah, is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 25, and it describes Adam as being not ashamed, not bush. And this is prior to the fall and the compromising of his role as high priest which seems to infer then that when he does compromise this role, bush or shame becomes an apt description afterwards. As long as he is functioning in this uncompromised position, wearing the mantle of the high priest upon the earth, he is not ashamed. The moment he compromises this role, that means he steps out from under that and now he is shamed. Now he is troubled, disturbed, confused, as well as put to silence. We see this same term in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. It says, And when the people saw that Moses delayed, Bush, to come down out of the mount, the people gathered themselves unto Aaron. And so begins the building of the molten calf and the loss of Israel's position as a nation of priests. Prior to this moment, coming out of Egypt, they were told, I've called you as a nation of priests to be holy unto me. The moment shame 
enters. The moment this takes place, they begin to build the molten calf. They lose this position. They step out from under the mantle that they were called to wear. And we find that when there is not one capable of operating as a priest, the door is left open for another to step in, bringing bush, bringing shame, leading to a troubled, disturbed, and confused mind or nephesh and renders those affected as silent. In other words, without the ability to declare and release the word, instead someone else now steps in to release and seed the people. It's quite interesting because it seems in that Korah simply exposes Israel's own shame and condition having rejected the mantle they were called to. How many of you realize that it seems, as we connect the dots, it seems to be that if Israel had accepted this role, if they had listened and chose to rise up to what Yahweh had told them to do, to be that nation of priests, there would have been no room for Korah to step in. But they rejected it. And when they rejected it, Korah now has an open door, and he's there, and he's used by Yahweh for a season to expose the shame of Israel. We have to ask the question then, could this coming Korah rebellion serve the same purpose? Will he be allowed to masquerade as the high priest on the earth for a season only to expose those who have themselves rejected this responsibility? And now they're made silent before the one knowing that they themselves chose not to take on this mantle, chose not to rise up and fulfill the responsibility and the obligation that they were called to. As we continue to look at this, we find that Adam was the first high priest upon the earth. When he allows himself to be compromised by death and comes in contact with the dead one, the Nakash, everything under his authority is now exiled and brought into bondage, all of creation. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. In other words, it's kind of give, it's these breadcrumbs giving you these connections. Adam was operating as the high priest upon the earth. When he compromises this role, it doesn't just affect Adam. It affects everything that was under the umbrella of Adam's priesthood, which happened to be all of creation. And so now, by his compromise, all of creation is exiled. All of creation goes into bondage. It would seem then to point towards the restoration of this office being the solution then as well. And we find that not only does Messiah then have to come and fulfill this role in order to restore creation, to bring creation and man out of exile, out of bondage, but perhaps it's also hinting towards you and I as well, once again, taking on this mantle in order to see creation set free. Amen? Romans chapter 8, verse 19 through 21 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of Elohim. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of Yah. In other words, it's still, creation's still waiting. The mantle's been made ready. It's been restored. It's been redeemed. And now all of creation is waiting for the mature sons and daughters to rise up and take on that mantle, having been restored and called back and given the name, the power, and authority to do so. Amen? This is why Israel, upon exiting the bondage of Egypt, They were called to be a nation of priests. They come out from under Pharaoh's bondage and priesthood, under Pharaoh's priesthood system. Their physical exile is over, and yet we find they enter into the wilderness, the Bamidbar, the place where the mouth is speaking forth the word. Why? Because they must renew their minds. They must enter this season where their minds, their nephesh is renewed in order to truly and fully be set free. And in turn, if they would have understood the pattern, if they would have understood what Yahweh was trying to show them, they would have set all of creation free. Exodus 19, 6, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. 
And yet we find that Israel, just like Adam, prostitutes themselves to the dead ones. They choose to build the molten calf. Not just an idol made of gold that they dance around, but a fallen entity behind that calf that's now worshipped. They choose to call and worship and prostitute themselves to the dead ones. And we find then that from that point forward, it's not until Messiah Yeshua walks the earth that once again this office is restored to its fullness. And he offers it to the nation as a whole again. 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness, out of bondage, out of exile, and into his marvelous light. Amen? And so we find that as a generation... As those that have been called and we're coming and we find that Yahweh's beginning to reveal this understanding, my goodness, you're standing in the exact same position that Israel was standing in as they stood at Sinai and they were called to be a nation of priests. Don't you realize that there's going to be an opportunity to prostitute and compromise yourself to the dead one? And what you do with this coming encounter is going to determine whether you will be a part of this nation of priests, this holy royal priesthood set apart unto Mashiach, or whether you will fall under and into the category of those that are involved in the rebellion of Korah. It seems the role of the priest is unique in its connection to the state of the nephesh or the mind. Are there further clues that help us to understand this connection, though? Perhaps the law of first reference will reveal more. We've already made the statement, and we've taught on this multiple times. Adam is the first high priest on the earth, and we find that he's given certain instructions that actually reveal this role. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, it says, And Yahweh Elohim took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. Right there, it already reveals Adam is functioning as the high priest on the earth. And in the English, you think, no, he's not. He's a gardener. He's put in the garden to dress it, to keep it, to take care of the garden. That's what that's about. But the Hebrew doesn't say that. Let's break this word down, these, this verse down. First, it says that Yahweh put him into the garden. The word put is Strong's number 3240, yanak, and it means to rest to settle down, to remain, to obtain rest, or to be granted rest. It comes from the root, strong number 5117, Nuach, to rest. It's also where we get the name Noah. It can indicate the place where the spirit, the name, or the glory of Yahweh rests. And it seems then to infer that Adam is strategically placed here in order to become the resting place of the name and the glory of Yahweh. And by doing so, he in turn causes or brings rest to the rest of creation. Amen. Adam becomes the living, walking, breathing tabernacle that's the resting place of the name. And just as Noah, that name was a prophetic name given to him that he was going to bring rest to creation. Why? Because all of creation was in exile and in bondage and was experiencing chaos and confusion. And yet when Noah would step onto the scene, he was a resting place for the name. And because of that name, he would bring rest to the rest of creation. And we find this is what Adam is doing from the very beginning in the garden. Why? Because in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. Tohu va bohu, chaos and confusion and darkness. And yet Yahweh then creates Adam, gives him the mantle and the role of the high priest and strategically puts him in the garden. Why? Now I have a resting place for my name. And because my name will rest upon him, he will bring rest and peace to all of creation. Amen? Adam being the resting place of the name of Yahweh, is directly connected to the responsibilities of dressing and keeping the garden. Because we're told that he put him in the garden in order to dress it and to keep it. The Hebrew words are avad and shamar. It's two Hebrew terms that are only seen joined together in regards to Adam's work in the Garden of Eden and in regards to the ministry of the priests. Right there, he immediately reveals 
Adam is functioning as the priest. And as that priest, he is charged with not only caretaking the garden, but the tabernacle, the resting place of the name. Let's look at the word for dress. He is told to dress it and to keep it. And this is where he begins to give us insight into what it means to walk as a nation of kings and priests. These are your responsibilities. You must dress it and you must keep it. The word dress is Strong's number 5647, avad. It means to work, to serve. It describes the priestly service or work. But if you break this word down, it's spelled with the ayin, bait, dalet. The ayin means to see, understand, to discern. The ayin bait root is the word for threshold. The bait dalet root means to separate. In other words, when Adam is told to dress the garden, he's literally being charged with standing at the threshold. He's guarding the altar. He's guarding the gateway. He's guarding the doorway, the access point. And he's separating, distinguishing that which brings forth life and stopping that which brings forth desolation in order to bring rest and peace and redemption to creation. What's quite interesting, though, is that avad, here, to dress, to work, to serve, is spelled with the ayin. But there's a cognate word in Hebrew, but it's spelled with the aleph. The aleph and the ayin are interchangeable. They're both silent letters. Unless you see it written, you wouldn't know which one was being used. Avad sounds exactly the same, but with the aleph. Forms Strong's number 6 through 8, and it means to perish, to be lost to wander, to destroy, to reduce to some degree of disorder, and it's linked with death. With every Hebrew word, we understand that it holds both a blessed aspect and a cursed. Do you think that perhaps Avad is revealing the effects of a compromised, prostituted priesthood? That the moment that one chooses to step into this role who has already been tainted by death, that now, instead of being a doorway, a vessel for rest and peace and restoration and redemption for all of creation, the one that chooses to step in this role, they now become a doorway for desolation, for exile, for destruction, and for death. In fact, avad with the olive is the root word of abaddon, the one who comes out of the gates in the book of Revelation that they're seeking to open. And so now you can begin to understand all of these things that are taking place, and it may seem as if it's two completely different fronts. It may seem as if, well, we're looking over here, and they're trying to build this third temple, but then they're over here doing all this other stuff. But now when you begin to look at Kor, all of a sudden you see, wait, this is all tentacles of the same mastermind behind it because he understands once these gateways get open, I need someone that's able to stand guard at these gateways to continue to make sure that this is what is going, that it's releasing it forth. And so we find that this priest, the one that's been defiled by death, contaminated or prostituted themselves to it, they now themselves become a doorway to exile, destruction, and death. Well, let's look at the word for keep. You're, Adam is told to dress it and to keep it. Keep is Strong's number 8104, shamar, and it means to keep, to guard, to observe, to give heed, to keep within the bounds or to restrain. How many realize that sometimes as the role of king and priest, there are certain things that you will have to keep within the bounds. There are boundary lines there for a reason. And some things have to be restrained. They have to be kept within their designated sections. Amen? Now, when you break apart this word shamar, it's sheen, mem, resh. The sheen, mem root is shem, its name. And we understand that the name, specifically the name of Yahweh, it's not just a word, it's not just a title, but his name represents his character, his authority, and his power. Sheen Mim, the name, is attached to the Hebrew letter Resh. It's the head. In other words, to keep, Shamar. Could it be inferring that as the priest you are to put my name upon the heads of Israel? It seems that this is reiterated with the priestly benediction of Numbers chapter 6, verse 27, where at the conclusion of Yahweh bless you and keep you, 
The very conclusion of this blessing was, and they shall put my name upon the children of Israel, and I will bless them. And we find that this wasn't something that was isolated just to Aaron here in Numbers. This was something all the way from the beginning. Adam, as the first priest, was given this responsibility of putting the name of Yahweh upon all of creation. Amen? And so we find then that the role of the Kohen, the role of the priest, and remember, you're to be a king and a priest, is to be the link, the connection between the name, character, authority, and power of Yahweh and the people. In other words, if you're walking as that holy priesthood, as that set-apart nation, the one that's functioning and has taken on this mantle that you've been offered by the Mashiach, then everywhere you go, his name, his character, his authority, his power should be evident, and it should be able to literally be be shared and put on others that come across your path, and they now are connected, plugged in. They now have this experience. Amen? And it's quite interesting because, especially in regards to Adam, it's not dealing with doing this in a season where everything's just easy and great. It's doing it in the season where he's also subjugating and dealing with chaos and confusion and things that would attempt to encroach into the garden, this place that Yahweh has created. And so now you can understand as the days ahead of us are also filled with this tohu vabohu, waste and desolation, attempting to encroach. You as a king and priest are charged with putting that in the bounds and instead releasing his name and seeing that be placed upon the people. Amen? Now as we look at this, remember, just as Avad has both a blessed aspect and a cursed aspect, when we look at Shamar, we have to remember once again that when dealing with the compromised aspect of this role, the principle will remain the same. It doesn't change whether it's one that's holy doing this or whether it's one that's prostituted and compromised doing this. It's still this role of the priest contains the ability to place one's name upon the head or the mind of another. Now, it's no accident that both Ezekiel and Revelation speak of a group being marked, being sealed in the forehead by Yahweh with his name. And it seems as if this group seems to stand in direct opposition to those who have already been marked or sealed by the beast in Revelation 13, 6. Well, now when we look at this, we understand it's not just a physical mark, but it literally has to do with your nephesh. It has to do with your mind itself. Do you think perhaps that this is directly connected with this role of priest? The connector, the one that has the ability to take the name and place it upon the people? With this foundation being laid, then is it possible that these prophecies regarding the mark and the forehead are actually directly connected and identifying factors regarding whose priesthood you serve under and are a part of? And if this is the case, then once again we have to question the role of the coming third temple. The role of this coming reinstituted priesthood after thousands of years that's going to rise up again, will this be a tool for the beast to mark with his name, authority, and character all those who choose to fall under its umbrella? Because this role, the role of king and priest, the role of the Kohen, this is the responsibility that's attached to that role, whether he is a righteous Kohen or whether he is a compromised Cohen that has prostituted himself to the dead ones. Korah understood the significance of this role. That's why he attempts to usurp this role, because the moment he can step into this role, he now has the ability not only to open this doorway even greater to release devastation, but he can now take and put the name of the one that he's serving upon the people. And so now you can understand it, it puts quite a different spin on this because Ezekiel and Revelation they talk quite a lot about being marked in the mind being marked by the name or one or the other isn't it interesting that there's, there's no middle ground you're marked by one or the other 
You will be a part of one or the other. You will fall up under the priesthood of either the Messiah and be marked by the name, therefore protected, and be one that goes forth also able to carry that name, or you'll be marked by the other. Now we find the Messiah fulfills both of these responsibilities as the Melchizedek high priest, the righteous king and priest on the earth. He dresses Avad and he gar- as he guards the threshold or the door. In John chapter 10, verse 9, in fact, not only does he say that he's guarding the door, he says, I am the door. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and he shall find pasture. Why does he use this terminology? I believe it's a direct breadcrumb and connection back. He's revealing, I'm the Kohen Hagadol. I've come as the high priest to restore you. And we find that he also keeps, he shamar, by revealing the name of Yahweh and placing it upon the people. In John chapter 17, verse 26, he says, And I have declared, I have manifested unto them thy name and will declare it. Amen. And we find that as we look at this, upon this example that is set right here, after Messiah comes and fulfills these obligations and paves the way, we're then charged and told that you're to be a royal priesthood. In other words, you too are charged with guarding the threshold, understanding that we've been given the responsibility and the authority to ensure that destruction and desolation does not cross. And we, too, are to be a resting place for his name. In the face of the coming Korah priestly system that will attempt to cover the nations with shame, leaving them in a troubled, disturbed, and confused state, they don't even understand what's happening to them, marked by his name, silenced before them, it'll be the chosen generation raised up as a royal priesthood that had been marked by the name of Yahweh, that are a resting place for his presence, that are called to stand in opposition, and these will be the very ones that all of creation is waiting upon to rise up. Amen? (laughs) You were chosen for just such a time as this. You could have been born at any point in the past thousand years, but Yahweh reserved and chose you specifically for this hour. And it's about this generation rising up and finally taking on the mantle that was restored by Messiah that Adam allowed to be compromised. And you're doing this in the face of the greatest opposition you will have ever seen. And yet, You're given the power and the authority to guard that threshold and say, stop. You're not allowed to cross. Destruction has no power here. Amen? Now, continuing to explore these powerful connections that lend prophetic insight into our days, it's quite intriguing to note that Joseph's head is also shaved when presented to Pharaoh. In Genesis chapter 41, verse 14, why is this significant? Joseph was Jacob's heir. Joseph was the firstborn. Joseph was the one chosen to take on the mantle of the kingship and the priesthood. And yet we find Pharaoh attempts to compromise this position and subjugate Joseph beneath his own covering. And we find that from that point forward, Joseph's descendants have been in that compromised position for generations. They haven't understood who they were. In fact, Joseph became the lost ones. They lost their identity completely. And that's who Messiah came for. I came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I've come for Joseph. Why? Messiah ben Yosef came to restore this mantle and identity. And now we find, as it's come full circle, Joseph's being restored. Once again, Joseph is becoming prominent. Joseph has a voice. He's no longer silenced. Joseph is beginning to release the word again and we have to ask the question will the joseph of today allow another to once again usurp this mantle or will we collectively stand and declare old joseph kai joseph lives there is one that is wearing the mantle There is no need and no opening for another to step in and bring shame and exile to the nations because old Yosef Kai, Joseph lives and has stepped into the role that he was created and called to fulfill. 
We find that we declare this as the name of the Most High enters the dry bones that have been lying in that valley. And as that name begins to be released and enter these bones, these bones become the habitation a resting place for his name and the breath enters into them and they stand up and I believe in the spiritual world you're going to see they begin to shake themselves and the enemy that's positioned himself in the high places is going to realize "Uh uh-oh my time is short The gateways that I think that I've been manipulating and controlling, the shame that I've blanketed the nations with is about to be exposed because the one that truly is the habitation of the name has has woken up, has begun to step onto the scene and take back the mantle and the authority and the power that goes along with being a king and a priest on the earth representing the one true king and priest, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. We're going to close with 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Amen. Old Yosef Kai. Yo- Joseph still lives. Amen. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah.